Why don't we start just discussing a little test for a little bit? Um, seems like there was one Piazza post about it, and then the floodgates opened up, and there's like five more questions within you know, a very short period of time. Um, let me just repeat what, what was said on Piazza. It's often mentioned in class before, but it's not, there's no hurt repeating it. The little test is going to be true, false, and multiple choice questions only. It's going to be, to prepare for it, you should be looking at the quizzes that you've taken over the semester. So it's going to be about the level of the quiz questions. Probably a little harder than those, but about that, the level of those. Not the level of a homework question or a midterm question. Okay, so we're trying to get you to recall, let's say, basic facts about the, the methods and, and uh, theory you've learned across the semester without having to do calculations. That's what the little test is getting at. So the hope is that um, you, know, you don't have to even study for this. It's, these things are, have been ingrained into your memory over taking the course, and so that by taking the quizzes over the course of the um, semester, you're already prepared for it. But it would not hurt to go back and look at the quiz questions. Uh, one thing you can do also, I think, would be a good study guide, is go back and look at the first slide of every lecture to get a recap of the previous lecture. So if you look back at the slides um, from each lecture, usually the first slide is something like last time, what we did last time, and then it gives you the basic points. That would also be good things to look through. Now, I'm not going to ask you some very detailed thing that requires calculation, just more like the basics, the fundamentals of the methods and theory you've learned. Um, you'll have the full 80 minutes to do it. It'll be on Monday. You know, I don't think you'll need the full 80 minutes. Um, it's not going to be long like the midterm was long. At least that's my intention, again. Um, and you will be allowed one sheet of notes, front and back. I decided that there's no hurt in that. Questions about that? All right. So that's on Monday. Make sure to um, you know, remember at least to look through some of the quizzes and, su and such before Monday. And then thir uh, next Wednesday, a week from today, you don't have class. So we're gonna, that period is just going to be left free um, for working on projects. And uh, I'm not going to show up here. Um, you don't have to show up here either. If you want to come ask questions, you're welcome to come to my office. You can talk about your project if you have questions. I'll be in my office at that time. So it'll be like an extra office hour for the week. Any questions about um, anything to come? OK, so you, will, you should hear by today a Piazza post that um, tells you which teams have been selected to give spotlight presentations and which teams are going to do posters. So six teams are going to do these presentations during our final period, which will be held, uh, I think it's Rashid Auditorium. So our final project uh, presentation period is May 7th. It's from 1 PM to 4 PM. That's the date that was given to us by the registrar for our final exam. We don't have a final exam. We'll be doing this instead. Um, I think it's in Rashid Auditorium in Gates. And six teams are going to be giving talks about let's say 10 to 12 minutes long. And everyone else is going to be doing a poster. And so by today, you'll see a post with, um, that'll tell you whether or not you're going to be doing a talk or a poster. If you do a talk, you don't have to prepare the poster. You only have to do the talk. You don't have to do both. OK, so unless there's, no, there's any questions, that'll, uh, that basically describes the rest of the course. Today's our last lecture. Um, I thought it'd be fun to end on this. This is something we ended on. Or we didn't end on this last year, but we had this last year. And I think it was kind of a fun, um, a fun lecture. Uh, there's no quiz today. This is not going to be covered on the, on the little test. The little test will cover everything up until last lecture, through last lecture. OK, so um, we're going to be talking about non-convex optimization today. And just a bit of motivation, you know, we've spent the whole semester on convex optimization. Um, in truth, if you didn't know what a convex optimization problem was before you took this class, if somebody asked you to formulate an optimization problem, you probably would have written down one that's non-convex. Right? Just because there are, way, there are many more ways to formulate a problem um, 
than what the kind of convex set of rules restricts us to. And in many cases, maybe the most natural thing to do that comes to mind is non-convex. So the picture you might think of is like, well, we learned convex optimization, right? It's this, this little tip of the iceberg. But really, in terms of the, the breadth of problems that we can solve, there's this huge non-convex world we haven't talked about. And in some ways, that's true. But in other ways, you know, the, the point of the course was trying to convince you that you can still do a lot of useful things, make lots of useful, form, formulate lots of useful statistical estimators while staying in the convex world. Today, we're going to talk a bit about what happens down here. Um, you know, in this kind of dark, gloomy, non-convex optimization world. So what are some takeaway points that you might think about before we start talking about non-convex problems? Well, um, you know, one of the main points of this class was that if it's possible, try to formulate the task that you're interested in doing, statistical task, say, in terms of a convex optimization problem, because it's, it's typically easier to solve and easier to analyze. Those are the two main things that we learned, right? You can kind of generically solve convex problems with one of many algorithms. They can be more or less efficient depending on the situation, but you have a very broad suite of, of uh, algorithms available to you that are guaranteed to converge in some sense. And we can also analyze them um, in a fruitful way often with the KKT conditions, which for a very broad class of convex problems are necessary and sufficient for characterizing optimality. So non-convex does not mean non-scientific. That's important to remember, right? If somebody comes up to you and says, this is my problem, I'm interested in solving it, it's, it's modeling some, say, physical system that is, you know, I'm trying to be, uh, I'm trying to study statistically, or it comes out of some very good model. If the problem is non-convex, it doesn't mean that it's not scientific. You shouldn't discard that completely, right? It just means that um, typically, whatever estimator comes out of that is going to have higher variance. So why do I say that? It's because with non-convex problems, we're not guaranteed to find global optima, right? We're not even guaranteed that local um, minima don't exist. So in running a non-convex uh, optimization algorithm, the answer we get will typically depend on our starting point. So what does that mean in terms of the statistical variance in estimation? It means that it's probably higher, right? Because you give me a new data set, um, that changes the landscape. I might change the, 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 spot, the spot where I started my algorithm, and I'll get to um, a different local minima, likely. So if I look at my estimate across, say, replications of data sets, it's likely to have higher variance than an estimator would have if it were um, posed in terms of a convex optimization problem. Does that make sense, hopefully, a very rough argument? So what does that mean in terms of, um, let's say, the mean squared error I can expect from this estimator? What is, how does higher variance have anything to do with mean squared error? This is a kind of fundamental point that everyone in stat and ML should, you know, have no problem shouting it out. What's that? Yeah, so it's the bias variance trade-off we're talking about, right? So um, it's a very basic point. Statistically, if I have two estimators that have the same bias, one has higher variance, the one with higher variance is going to have a higher mean squared error. So um, this is one reason why you may be shy about solving a non-convex problem, even aside from the algorithmic complications. Right? Statistically, it probably is going to inflate the variance. And, and if, if you're not uh, achieving a big gain in bias, it'll inflate the mean squared error. OK, but in some cases, um, which we're going to cover today, Non-convex problems can be solved exactly. So you're not going to have this issue of local minima, because uh, there are a suite of non-convex problems. And there's, there's more slides that we can go through today. So there's a lot of problems that I've listed. And there's some, I'm sure there's some that I haven't listed that are relevant as well that I've just forgotten to put in there um, that you can, we can actually solve to global optimality. Yeah, did you have a question? Can you straight write non-convex in high I'm sorry? Yeah, sure. It was just a very um, heuristic argument, but the argument was as follows. Um, you know, let's suppose I give you two settings, one in which you have a surface that's very non-convex, and one in which you have a surface that's convex. Now, if I perturb the input data, you can imagine that both of those surfaces should change in some smooth way. 
let's suppose that the, the service we're trying to optimize, the function we're trying to optimize, is actually continuous in the inputs. So they both move in some kind of smooth way. But the non-convex one, you know, let's suppose that I have this non-convex surface that looks like this. Right, if I perturb this in some smooth way, it could mean all of a sudden that, let's suppose that this local minimum was actually lower than this one. Right, some, some, I do something smooth here. This is maybe supposed to not go down, but some smooth perturbation to this. And now, depending on where I start on this new service, I could either end up here or here. Right? Maybe before, even if I initialized the algorithm the same, I, I used some kind of descent algorithm. On the first surface, I'd end up here. And on the second surface, I'd end up here. Or, right. It would help if these were drawn in colors, but something like that. OK, so it's heuristically kind of uh, easy to believe that if, even if my function I'm trying to optimize is smooth as a function of the input data, then I can get very different answers depending on what realization I'm looking at if the service is non-convex. Right, so these might have very different statistical properties, these two points. Whereas if the surface is convex, then it, this can't really happen. Right? Some smooth perturbation of the surface is going to mean that the minimum moves in some smooth way as well. OK, so um, this is not, like I said, to kind of dump on non-convex optimization, because uh, truthfully, there is a, you know, you could take an entire class on methods that um, try to be somewhat general in terms of their pursuit of optimality. And it's not something that we're going to cover in this lecture. But rather, we're going to look at kind of the most favorable case for non-convex optimization, which is problems in which you can solve exactly the global optimality. And um, I think this is, it's just supposed to be a fun survey of problems. And you know, maybe in the future, you'll come across a problem that looks like one of these. And you'll look up one of the, the, the reference for this problem. And you'll see that actually you know, the non-convex problem you're interested in either is very close to one that can be solved exactly, or maybe it even can be itself. Just a, a kind of a nice, fun survey of problems to show you how, how, um, how frequently non-convex problems show up and when we can actually solve them exactly. So first, let's just talk about what does it mean for a problem to be non-convex. Um, so remember our, our generic framework for an optimization problem, minimize some function subject to inequality and equality constraints on other functions. If we say this problem is convex, then it means that uh, the inequality constraints in the, the function we're minimizing are convex, uh, and that these equality constraints are affine. Remember, that was our definition, of course. A non-convex problem is one that's this form where not all these conditions are met. That's all it means. Um, but that's not a very good definition of a non-convex problem because it includes really trivial cases. So let's suppose I wrote down a convex problem that looked like this, right? The same. The same form, but I, I just told you that it was. These are all uh, convex functions. F and or F and H are convex functions. And now I just did something like this, where I added some very, um, let's say, some very complicated non-convex function of, of y. And I added the constraint that g of y should be 0. So I haven't changed the problem. right? It's not any different problem, obviously. It's just a trivial introduction of the of variable y. But um, per our definition, this is not a a convex function anymore of x and y, right? I said, let's suppose this is some very ugly non-convex function. And actually, this is not a, a linear equality constraint. So this is a non-convex problem. It's trivially reducible to a convex one, but it's still non-convex per the definition. So kind of implicit in what we talk about today and what we really talk about in general when we talk about non-convex optimization is that we talk about problems that aren't kind of trivially reducible to convex ones, right? Per the strict definition, it's not really very useful to talk about non-convex problems. So if, if you have a problem that you're, you claim is non-convex, and it's, there's kind of a, a trivial or, or even just a few line equivalence between that and a convex one, that's not really something that we're going to call a non-convex problem. 
Um, what does it mean to solve a non-convex problem? Well, um, it really means solve in, in, the, in the sense of global optimality. Remember, we learned that um, non-convex problems can have local minima. Actually, we didn't really learn this formally. We just can see in examples they have local minima. Right, that there can be a point x that uh, is feasible and it satisfies um, the, the property that it's, big, it's smaller than or equal to f of y for all feasible y in a neighborhood of, of x, but it's not globally optimal. We've just seen examples of that. You, know, you can draw any simple 1D example and convince yourself of that property. And we proved, of course, this couldn't happen for convex problems. We proved that in the first lecture. That was one of the redeeming qualities of, of convex problems. So, of course, we mean um, by solving non-convex problem, at least in this lecture, we're going to mean uh, solving the problem to global optimality. And we also mean doing it efficiently. Implicitly, we're not going to consider problems where we can solve a non-convex problem, but we can't do it in polynomial time. OK? This is just a very, these are all rough guidelines for what I'd say you can think about when one talks about solving non-convex problems. Um, there are really many addendums that uh, should be put here. I, I um, you know, with, there's actually a lot of neat work that's going on right now with non-convex optimization, and so I maybe should have written a few more lines here. But um, let me say it again that uh, I'm not giving you general recipes to solve non-convex problems. I'm just pointing out specific problems that I think are interesting and are surprisingly tractable. And it's really about putting together problems that maybe look hard and end up being solvable. So even some of the problems I'll mention are actually convex, but just are not um, maybe phrased in the way that you typically see problems in this class. And there's work that's going on right now. Uh, in fact, this last NIPS was full of um, this kind of work. And I think it'll be important for some years to come with people who are studying the statistical properties of local minimizers. So I told you that. You know, if you're solving a problem to local optimality, then it, you can think of it heuristically as meaning higher variance. I think that's a fair point. But um, out of the ML and stats communities, there's a bunch of new work that studies the statistical properties of actually these local minima, not only the global optimizer, and says that under some situations, if you initialize the algorithm properly, you can believe that the local minimizer has itself some kind of favorable statistical property, say in terms of its test error or something. OK, so there's a lot of neat work on that um, that I, I haven't mentioned and I'm not going to go through. That's just kind of coming out in the last few years. OK, so absolutely no way we're going to go through all this. I basically picked um, that seven, seven different broad areas. And I, I think I wrote down something like two problems per area. And we may just end up going through one per area or just skipping some completely. So if there's something of interest or running out of time, then, I'll, then let me know. And we'll get to, we can skip something in, in particular and, and cover the thing that's interesting. So here's the first kind of uh, category that I would um, put forward, which is classic or core non-convex problems. So these are problems that come out of the optimization literature that are non-convex um, and are, are somewhat classic in the sense that there's a lot of work that studied them. So one of the first ones is a linear fractional program. That's a problem of the form uh, minimize some linear function divided by another linear function subject to linear inequality and equality constraints. So it looks like an LP, except for the criterion is a ratio of linear functions rather than a single linear function. It's called a linear fractional program. And there's actually a constraint that the denominator has to be positive in the linear fractional program. So certainly we have to make it non-zero. And actually, in a linear fractional problem, we restrict it to having a consistent sign as well. Right? So it actually could be positive or negative. It doesn't matter, obviously. Um, this is not a convex problem, because a, linear, uh, a ratio of linear functions is not convex. Um, now, uh, this is actually a quasi-convex problem. Did we learn quasi-convexity? I think we talked about quasi-convexity in the first lecture. So who remembers what a quasi-convex function is? No? We didn't spend much time on it. Right. 
quasi-convex function has, sub, uh, has the property that all of its sublevel sets are convex. So, so does a convex function, right? So every quasi-convex function is convex, but not the other way around. Uh, I said that backwards. Every convex function is quasi-convex, not the other way around. Because it's not enough for having convex sublevel sets is not enough to imply that the function is convex. So here's an easy example of a um, quasi-convex function that's not convex. Think of um, the function that gives you the square root of, uh, say, the absolute value of x. OK, there's a function whose sublevel sets um, Actually, you know, these aren't. No, these are, yeah, these, this has uh, sublevel sets that are all convex, right? The sublevel sets look like all these sets here. Of course, these are all convex sets. The function itself is not convex, OK? So um, quasi-convex programming is something that we didn't cover in this class, but that you can look at and say in Boyd and Vandenberg as an example of where they cover it. So these are, are problems that are not in the, strictly in the convex optimization domain, but they can be dealt with in some sense. This is a nice example of a quasi-convex problem. Um, in fact, this is not really, it's not really uh, fair to categorize this as a quasi-convex problem because it's, e it's equivalent to a convex one. So I mean, anytime you see a linear fractional program, it turns out you can actually rewrite it as a linear program. Now, the reduction from this to this is not trivial, which is why I'm including it in this list. This requires a little bit of work. It's not that long, but it's not trivial. Um, and if you're interested, you can see, I think it's I list it here, chapter four of Boyd and Vandenberg. And you can, there's actually an even more broad class of problems that you might think of as linear fractional programs that you can reduce to um, something that looks like a linear program in the sense that it has a linear uh, criterion. The, the more broad class is if, suppose we had an infinite number of inequality constraints, linear inequality constraints, then we can actually reduce that to an LP with an infinite number of linear inequality constraints as well. Um, and so there's some information in that chapter about the reduction. And linear fractional programs are kind of interesting um, because they show up in a bunch of different places. One of the places that they show up is in statistical estimation problems. So we talked a bit about um, these. Actually, we talked, I guess, in some detail about these problems we might write down, right, where we have some instance of a loss function plus lambda times a regularizer. Might want to minimize a problem like this. And we, talked, we didn't talk about the algorithms. We skipped this lecture because it wasn't voted into the, the most popular advanced topics. But you can actually, in some cases, you can solve for the solution x as a function of lambda, which we call the solution path. And OK, well, because we skipped that lecture, I'll just tell you the, here are basically the times that we, you can do that. If L is quadratic based on the L1 norm, based on the L infinity norm, or R is quadratic based on the L1, based on the L, based on the L1 norm, based on the L infinity norm, so in any of those combinations of loss and regularizers, the solution path can be computed exactly. Okay, and there's more exceptions to that, but that's just kind of the general class you can think of. And these solution paths, they all have the feature that um, there are knots in, in the solution path, which means value of, values of lambda at which the solution changes in some sense. So the solution path algorithms proceed by finding these knots and then doing something in between those knots that it knows, it knows the the functional form of the solution as a function of lambda in between those knots. Those knots actually, in many cases, say in the lasso path, which is um, you know, the case where this is quadratic and that's the L1 norm, they can be seen as the optimal value of linear fractional pro programs. So actually, somehow, you know, nobody designed the lasso to make this the case, but it turns out that each knot in the lasso path you can see as, as the optimal value of a problem like this. It achieves the optimum of some linear fractional pro problem. So th there's, they're interesting in, in that sense. They, they have their role in, in statistical estimation. Um, geometric programming is another example of 
a kind of classic non-convex problem that um, people study in optimization that is reducible to a convex one. Again, it's not necessarily a trivial reduction, which is why it's on this list. Uh, did we talk about this early in the class? I think it was on the slides, but that lecture was one that Nicole gave. So I don't know. Yes or no? No? OK. Well, we can just, let's just go through it somewhat quickly now. Um, geometric programs are interesting. Um, they're phrased entirely in terms of monomials and posinomials, um, which I'm bound to mess up their pronunciation. I feel like I just never remember this word monomial, how many ends it has in it. But uh, there's, a, there's a whole kind of field of optimization that, that uh, people care about uh, these polynomial type optimization problems. And a monomial, let's just think of as a function that takes positive valued arguments. So it goes from Rn plus plus to R. And it's of the following form. It's equal to some uh, constant gamma times a product of its components raised to some power. Each of these powers can be real valued. They don't need to be positive. They don't need to be integral. So they're just real valued fractional, possibly fractional powers. Um, a polynomial is a sum of monomials. So it's what happens if we take, say, p of these guys and sum them together. So these coefficients, the leading coefficient and the powers, are allowed to change across the monomials. So a geometric program is one of, of the kind of standard form that we know, except for f and gi. Instead of restricting them to be convex, right, in a kind of classic convex problem, we restrict them to be polynomials, so a sum of monomials. And hj, each hj, is restricted to be a monomial. That's what we call a geometric program. And the right-hand sides of the constraints changes from 0 to 1. So the restriction is that our, our sum of monomials, or our polynomials g, have to be less than or equal to 1. And each of our monomials has to be equal to 1. That's our feasible set. So that's a non-convex problem, but it's equivalent to a convex one right? via um, a fairly simple transformation. And this is what we'll go through quickly, since we didn't do it at the start of the class. Um, if you just substitute yi for log xi everywhere, and you think of this function as a function of y instead of as a function of x, then um, another way of writing that right, is, is substituting uh, xi for e to the yi. So each of these terms in this monomial becomes uh, e to the appropriate component of y. And the entire thing looks like e to the a transpose y plus b. Right? I got b from moving this into the exponent, and I got a just from collecting um, the powers uh, across all the different components. So I can think of a monomial in terms of a reparameterization as e to the a transpose y plus b. Similarly, a polynomial can be written as a sum of these guys. That's it. Right? All I'm going to do is change the a's and the b's and sum them up. So with this variable substitution, um, I can think of the geometric program in, as the following. There should be a y here. I don't know why I forgot that. So it's, now it's a problem over y. But we're minimizing the log sum of exponentials subject to um, so what I've done is I've taken logs as well. I've not only substituted in uh, y for x, I've, I've also taken logs. Subject to the constraint that we'll take log of both sides in this constraint, you get log of um, the sum of uh, exponentials is less than or equal to 0. And lastly, take logs on both sides of this constraint. Remember, this was a monomial. Right? I get 0, and here I get log of e to the a transpose y plus b, so I just get a bunch of linear constraints. So this, we know, is a convex problem, because we know that the log sum of exponentials is a convex function, right? composed with a linear function. It's still convex. So a geometric program is reducible to this convex problem. Geometric programs have their place in a bunch of different um, applications. One of them was an interesting application it's uh, a floor planning um, program that uh, is, is either, I think it's in the Boyd and Vandenberg book in chapter 8.8. .8, and they also have a nice review paper on 
Boyd and some of his co-authors have a nice review paper on geometric programming. So that's something that you can take a look at if you're interested. Um, recently, so Sivrit Sra was a visitor. He visited the ML department last year. He has a pretty neat paper that extends geometric programming to kind of the matrix realm. So you can think of this paper as geometric programming over matrices. It's quite an interesting paper. Um, it, it's also, you know, I think fairly sophisticated mathematically, but it, I think it's a, it's a very interesting extension of geometric programming if you're, if you're curious. All right, we're just going to keep going through these quickly because, uh, well, one, you don't have to do homework on this, so you shouldn't be too bothered if we go through quickly. And, and two, I think there's a lot of fun problems to cover. So slow me down if something is uh, not clear or you want to hear more details. Otherwise, we'll just keep going quickly. Um, here's the, an, a third topic that kind of comes from the classic slash core convex, a non-convex optimization category, which is how to turn non-convex equality, or how to, yeah, to, I guess you can call them non-convex equality constraints, meaning that they are not linear functions that we're setting equal to zero, into uh, ones that are acceptable by convex pro problems, which are ones where the, we have a linear function equal to zero. So, or sorry, rather where we have that function less than or equal to zero. So here's the, um, the problem form. Let's suppose we had uh, this problem where I tell you that all the functions are convex. So it's a non-convex problem because L of x is, is not necessarily affine. So it doesn't fit into your standard framework for convex optimization. A convex relaxation would, of course, just re relax this equality constraint into an inequality constraint, right? Turn this into Lx less than or equal to zero. That would be the first thing you would think to try if someone gave you this problem in practice. Right? But you know that the solution to this problem can only be lower than, in terms of its optimal criterion value than the solution to this problem because the feasible set you've just made larger. But the question is, when is this relaxation tight? When have you actually solved this relaxation and uh, preserved, say, the optimal criterion value and more, more you're more interested in the solution? You've actually, you're guaranteed to have the solution. Um, there was a problem on your homework that you did. The second lecture, the first or second lecture, we talked about this as well, that gives you a general prescription for when this relaxation is tight. Now, those are sufficient conditions. They're not necessary. They're very far from necessary. But they're sufficient conditions for when this relaxation is tight. Um, they have to do with basically the monotonicity of these functions in the feasible set. And you had an example also of when you could see it kind of intuitively, which was this maximum utility problem that we covered at the start of class. Because we covered that, I'm going to skip it. Uh, it was also on your homework. But I'm just reminding you that you know, in practice, if you have this problem, the first thing you do would be to relax to this convex one. And then you could think about either intuitively how you could show this, or you could refer to that earlier homework problem where you had a prescription for how to prove that relaxation is, is a tight one. Um, the fourth example, I think it's the last one, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the fourth example in the classic and core problems list was problems that involve two quadratic functions. So it's, it's a problem where I have minimized one quadratic subject to another quadratic equality, uh, inequality constraint. What makes this non-convex is that I don't actually guarantee, I don't in, uh, enforce that these quadratic uh, forms are, are um, convex ones in the sense that the matrices A0 and A1 need not be PSD, right? Or even positive semi-definite. They could have negative eigenvalues. So that makes this a non-convex problem, right? Which is, again, generically outside of the problems that we know how to solve. But here's a very interesting application of duality. In this case, you can write down the dual problem. Here it is. It'd be a good exercise for you to drive the dual problem of this and show that it's equal to this. And as we know, which is always the case, this dual problem is always convex, right? Regardless of A0 and A1, this is always a convex problem. That's one property we know about duality. So we've put ourselves in a good situation. However, I still have to tell you whether or not these two problems are equivalent in the sense of strong duality. If they weren't, then this, you know, Dual derivation wouldn't be that useful. It turns out that for this problem involving two quadratics, strong duality always holds. So it's a very interesting and also very powerful application of duality. 
you can take this non-convex problem involving two quadratics. You can derive its dual in closed form. That problem's convex, and strong duality holds. So you can go ahead and solve the dual. This is found in Appendix B of the Boyd and Vandenberg textbook. There's also some nice subsequent work on problems that involve, um, I think that in this paper, they actually look beyond the two quadratic function case. Okay, so take a look at this paper as well. Okay, so we blazed through the classic and uh, core non-convex problems list. And now we're going to go through all the other topics, and I'll probably just pick out one of each of these to talk about. So here's the next category, which is called, I, I'm going to call eigenproblems. So these are a class of problems in which they're non-convex, but you can get global optima um, from looking at eigen decompositions of kind of key quantities. PCA is probably the most, uh, it's, I'd say it's the most central problem to this category. It's one that you guys all know, and you've seen many times in other classes. But if we look at the PCA problem in its kind of generic description, it's not a convex problem. So if I give you a matrix Y, it's n by p, and I ask you to um, approximate it by another matrix X, and I tell you that I want, to have, I want X to have rank let's say equal to k for some integer k where k is fixed, and I want to choose x so that the Frobenius norm between y and x is as small as possible, meaning that right, the sum of squared distances between y and yij and xij is as small as possible, summed up over all elements, then um, you know, right, you should know from other classes that the answer to this is do a, an eigen decomposition of y and take the leading uh, k factors. I, I take an ID decomposition of y. I look at the, um, you know, that part that I say is UDV transpose. I take, I chop off, say, the bottom, uh, you know, rank, whatever the rank is, called the rank r, r minus k singular values in d. I set, the, set those equal to zero, and then I basically just remultiply. Another way of writing that is I take just the first left uh, top k singular vectors. I multiply them by the first k singular values, and multiply by the top right k singular vectors. OK, so all I'm doing is I'm chopping off the bottom all but the top k singular values. That reconstruction, which I get from uh, the eigen decomposition of x, it actually is the solution to this problem, something that you, you know, either would have seen in another class or would have remembered from um, the properties of PCA that, you've, that you would have seen somewhere. So this is not a convex problem, right? What makes this non-convex is the constraint set. Of course, this is a convex criterion. This constraint set is non-convex. Right? That should be very easy for you to see. Um, in one of a few ways. First of all, the rank function is kind of analogous to the L0 norm. So rank is to matrices in some sense as the L0 norm is to vectors. It's because we're counting the number of non-zero singular, value, uh, singular values, right? So we're really counting the number of non-zero something. For vectors, it's just their entries. And for matrices, it's their singular values. So what's another easy way to see that the rank function is non-convex? Let's suppose I, I, I give you two matrices, right? This one and this one. They both have rank 1. Take a convex combination of them, say take half of this times half of this, that matrix has rank two, right? If I take a convex combination, it just gives me this with weight a half. So clearly convex combinations of rank one matrices don't lie in the rank one matrix set. So how do we know that this, the solution to this problem is actually the, the PCA decomposition? That's not something that is trivial to show. Um, it's, it's not a very lengthy proof, but I think it's, it, it, it's, uh, its name is often forgotten. It's just kind of this fact that we internalize when we learn uh, PCA for the first time. But it's called the Eckert-Young theorem. And it was actually proved a long time ago, 1936. Uh, there's some suspicion that it was known even earlier than that as well. 
So people knew about this for a long time. This is, I think this was after principal components analysis was basically proposed as a data analysis tool in statistics. But there's some, there's some arguments which you can take a look at this paper, which gives you the history of the SVD, a nice review paper, that the claims that um, this result was known even before Eckert and Young uh, published it in 1936. Here's a very interesting way to look at um, the, that best rank K projection problem. And it's through what we're going to call the phantope. I think you might have seen this in an earlier lecture, but I wanted to go through it again because I think it's just such a neat, it's such a neat um, reparameterization of the problem. So we can think about this you know, best rank K um, matrix X in a different way. We can think about it as um, Oops, I think I wrote this down. No, oh, no, I, sorry. This is, this is a equivalent characterization. So in this case, I'm looking at a matrix that's n by p. In this case, I want to look at the, um, the gram matrix, or the, ma the matrix in the y transpose y, which I'm writing as s. So this problem is equivalent to the PCA problem. All I'm doing here is finding the right singular factors. Once you have the right ones and you have the matrix, you can get the left one, which is the matrix multiplication. So finding either u or v is sufficient for solving the previous problem. So I'm just reparameterizing as a problem where we're just solving for the right singular factors, v. In other words, you can think about this matrix, S, as y transpose y from the previous slide. So y is the input matrix. So let's suppose you give me a, a symmetric matrix, S, and I ask you to find um, another matrix Z that approximates it best in terms of Frobenius norm that has two properties. The first that it has rank K, and the second that it's, is that it's a projection matrix. Okay, so both of these are actually non-convex constraints. Constraining Z to have rank K and constraining Z to be a projection is an intersection of two non-convex sets. It's still non-convex. The solution to this problem, as you know, again from, from your PCA knowledge, is that take the top left, uh, the top k right singular factors, vk, and form vk, vk transpose. That'll give you a pro the, the appropriate projection matrix. It's going to be the projection, in this case, onto the row space um, of y for the, the top k, uh, in, the, in the top k singular directions. This one is, in fact, equivalent to a convex problem. This is something I think people don't really see very often, and I wasn't even aware of it until a few years ago, although this result is very old. And let's see that equivalence, because I think it's so neat. We're going to start by expressing the constraints at C, um, right, it's just a set of all matrices Z that have rank K, and for which Z is a projection. That's just literally what this constraint set is. And we can rewrite that in a, in a way that's maybe more useful to work with, which is that um, well, Z is, is uh, we force it to be symmetric since the projection matrix. So Z is equal to Z transpose. That's one part of the constraint. A projection matrix, um, which is something you might remember, the two characterizing properties that it's symmetric and all of its eigenvalues are either equal to zero or one. That completely characterizes the, a projection matrix, those two properties. So I've just written them down here. Symmetric and Lambda i, which is the ith eigenvalue of z, is, is just either equal to 0, 1 for each i going from 1 to p. And now that I have these two written down, and I enforce its rank to be equal to k, I can actually write that as just the trace of z is equal to k. OK? So let's look at this constraint set. What is the offending constraint here? So th is this a non-convex constraint, trace c equals k? It's not, right? This is a linear, trace is a linear function of z. So this is just a linear um, constraint on z. It's just adding up the diagonal elements. How about this one? Is that non-convex? Is z equals z transpose a convex constraint? It's linear, right? So think about unraveling z into a big, long vector. z is just that vector. z transpose is just a linear function times that vector that rearranges the components. So I'm just asking for 
a linear function of z to be equal to 0, so, um, or two linear functions to be equal to each other. So these are both fine. So they're both linear equality constraints. It's this one. Right? That's the one that is, um, yeah, Jersey. Right, so for a projection matrix, its rank is equal to the, uh, its trace. Um, so the rank is equal to the sum of the eigenvalues. Right, so for a projection matrix, it's, it's, no, the rank is equal to the number of non-zero eigenvalues. For a projection matrix, its rank is always equal to, uh, its eigenvalues are always equal to zero or one. So their sum is going to give you the rank. OK, so this is the constraint that's non-convex. Right? This is the one that is offensive in some sense if we're trying to solve this problem. So what would you do in this case? What would be the thing you'd think about trying? How would you relax this constraint? Think about what you do in an integer program. If I told you I had a value, a, a variable x that has to take value 0 or 1, what would be the most natural relaxation for that? Right, I just say, well, let's just try letting this variable lie between 0 and 1. OK, that actually turns out to be, that relaxation is equivalent to um, relaxing C to its convex hull. So another exercise that you can check, um, I think it's a good exercise to do, just practice with, with these concepts. So the convex hull of C is actually the set of all z's for which these two linear constraints still hold. But the eigenvalues are all between 0 and 1 um, in terms of the interval 0, 1, not just the set 0 and 1. That set I can also think about as the set of all z's that are symmetric. Their trace is equal to k. And I can just express this like this. Right? this the eigenvalues lying between 0 and 1 says that Z has to be positive semi-definite, and I minus Z has to be positive semi-definite as well. It's the same, the same constraint set. This set is called the phantope of order K. It has a name. Um, it's, it's kind of, you can think of it like a polyhedron over matrices, which is where the name phantope comes from. It's a bounded polyhedron or a polytope over matrices. The name fan is actually, I think, attributed to the author of the paper that um, kind of first studied this, this set. This, paper 1949. Now, what we said uh, in kind of our progress all along was that, well, we can just change the constraints from having eigenvalues equal to 0, 1 to having eigenvalues between 0 and 1. Another way of writing that is that we're just going to change this constraint set from being z and c to, be, to being z in the convex hull of c, which I called fk, the phantope of order k. This is a convex problem, though. Right? You could solve this as an SDP. You, if you you know, even if you forgot all of the kind of wonderful primal dual and chair point methods that we learned and that Javier taught us, you could just pull up Sudumi or CVX and solve it. So what would happen if you did that? What would happen is actually that you got uniquely the PCA solution. So that the solution to this problem, first of all, it's unique. Second of all, uh, it is equal to the solution to this problem. So it's unique under very general conditions on S, as long as S isn't, isn't degenerate in some way. So this is an example where the convex relaxation is actually tight. So there's no reason to form it and to call Sudumi. You can just take the, uh, the eigendecomposition of, of, of S. So this is a result that was, uh, it's found in this paper by, I think Fan was a mathematician. And he was interested in the phantope for mathematical reasons. Um, and a proof of this relaxation being tight, you can find in this paper by Overton and Wormersley. I think I've, this paper is, the proofs are kind of maybe more clear and more relevant to the, our discussion than the original paper by Fan. I think it's a very interesting, like I said, fact that a lot of people don't know. Um, I didn't know about it until a couple of years ago when one of uh, my colleagues in statistics, Vince Vu, he's uh, a junior faculty member in stats, he found this, and he was very excited about it. And um, he used it as a kind of 
framework for, in, for introducing a new sparse PCA estimator. Right, so what makes sparse PCA so hard is that the PCA problem in and of itself is not convex when posed. So if I told you that I only want to estimate the, you know, the PCA directions, so the, the left and right singular factors, but I also want them to be sparse, which is you know, a natural idea considering what we do in regression, then it's hard to do that because the original problem wasn't convex. So adding an L1 norm is not really going to, adding a convex regularizer is not going to put you in a good situation because the problem itself wasn't convex. So people have been struggling with sparse PCA for a long time. Vince uh, Vu, um, actually, I'm sorry, I said Vince was a junior faculty member here. He was a junior faculty member here a few years ago. He moved to Ohio State. Um, Jing Lei, who's also a junior faculty member here, Vince and Jing, did this work together. Jing is still here. Um, they wrote this paper which basically used this as a framework for getting a sparse PCA estimate. So they added an L1 penalty in some sense here. And that's now a convex problem that they can solve. Once the L1 penalty is introduced, I do not think it's true that this problem is equivalent to the L1 penalized original problem. So the introduction of the L1 penalty messes up that equivalence. But you, know, you may not care about that original problem because it was so hard to solve that it would be intractable in some sense. Um, MDS is another example of an Eigen problem that uh, we can solve exactly that's non-convex. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip it. But if you're interested in multidimensional scaling, take a look at um, this book, The Elements of Statistical Learning, and take a look at how they solve this problem. It's a neat example, again, of how Eigen decomposition comes to the rescue and saves us from a non-convex um, optimization problem. All right. And I'm going to skip this generalized eigenvalue problem as well because we just don't have time. So there, there's a rich class of problems where the SVD basically comes to the rescue to help you out when the problem's non-convex. Let's take a break. It's not a bad spot to take a break. And then we'll come back and talk about graph problems. Don't mind this blazing speed because we're going to continue with it. Uh, I'm going to just quickly go through the graph problems because we already talked about the max flow min cut equivalence. So I'll just remind you that actually min cut is non convex. And if those of you who are in CS, you would have taken a course on, on graph theory or graph algorithms where you would have seen lots of non convex problems that you can solve. Exactly. So min cut is an example of a problem um, that's non convex. Remember, we idea is we're given a graph. Um, we have uh, costs on the edges of this graph. And I tell you that I want you to come up with uh, basically a set of nodes such that that set in its complements, and its complement minimize the cut, which is the sum of the edges that cross, um, cross over from one set to the other. So in this case, it would be the sum of, of these costs, right? The, the cost in this edge, this edge, and this edge summed up altogether. That problem we can formulate like this, which almost looks like an LP, except for I constrain the variables b, xi, and xj all to be either 0 or 1. So it's actually an integer program, not a linear program, because we're constraining them to either be only 0 or 1. bij is the indicator, basically, that this edge traverses the cut, whether the edge you know, between i and j traverses the cut. So it's either 0 or 1, if that edge traverses the cut or not. And xi is the, gives you the membership of node i, whether it's in, you know, say, the set um, A or A complement, where A is the set you're trying to find. So this is the min cut problem. We learned when we talked about duality that actually um, when we relax this problem into an LP, so we basically, you can think about it again, turning those 0, 1 constraints into interval 0, 1. That's all that's being done. But then you can kind of throw out some of those constraints because they're extraneous. This is the LP relaxation of it. We learned this is actually equivalent to max flow. So the dual of that problem is the max flow problem. In fact, I think we maybe even went to the proof of that in class. And then there's another uh, kind of well-established result in network flow, which says that max flow and min cut have the same optimal value. There's strong duality there. Um, and in fact, it's even more than strong duality because min cut is non-convex. So in particular, that tells you that 
min cut and its relaxation have the same optimal value because they're kind of sandwiched in between min cut and max flow. So go back to lecture 12 to see that in more detail, just reminding you that the min cut problem is one that's non-convex, but when we relax it uh, to an LP, which we can solve, um, it, we get the exact solution. Shortest paths in another non-convex problem, it's a classic one in, in CS. Um, if I give you a graph and I ask you, did I just give you two nodes in the graph and I ask you to find the shortest path between those two nodes as a sum of edge lengths, directed graph? Um, that's a non-convex problem. If you think about writing down the optimization problem, it'll look something like this. I'm not going to go through this because we just don't have much time. Um, Dijkstra's algorithm will solve this problem for you. It'll actually do even more than that. It'll give you a shortest path tree. So those of you in CS probably remember this from another class. So it'll, it gives you the shortest paths if you pick out a node S between S and every other node in the graph. So it gives you more than just the shortest path between S and T, say, if we move a node T. And um, it's also solvable in a, in, a, in a very reasonable order. So the, I think, that, I mean, I'm not an expert on um, this stuff, but as far as I can tell, some of the best implementations run in size of edges times log size of nodes. It's really quite fast. You can do it for big graphs. OK. Um, Non-convex prox operators. This is interesting, an in interesting class of problems. So here's the simplest non-convex pro prox operator that you probably have seen. It's hard thresholding. So I suppose I give you the problem where I want you to find the prox operator essentially of the L0 norm. This is really the L0 norm, but it's a weighted L0 norm. So each um, element being 0 is weighted by a different amount, lambda i. The solution to this problem is just hard thresholding. So you take yi, and you set it equal to 0, or you leave it at its value yi, depending on whether or not yi squared is bigger than lambda i. You call that output beta i. That is the solution to this problem. It's very easy to see that, right, by inspection, right? So first of all, we just say that, well, this is a sum over i, but those problems have nothing to do with each other. So minimizing that sum is the same as minimizing each term. So now think about just minimizing one term, which is yi minus beta i squared plus lambda i times the indicator that beta i is not equal to 0. Forget about all the other, other ones, because they can be done separately as well. So there are two cases. If beta i is equal to 0, right, then this term uh, is equal to 0, and this term is equal to yi squared. So that's one case. The criterion value is yi squared. The second case is when beta i is not equal to 0. When beta i is not equal to 0, what value should we give it? We should just give it yi, right? Because if beta i is not equal to 0, then this part doesn't change. The penalty is invariant. If I take yi over 2, or 2yi, whatever, it's, you get the same penalty. It's lambda i. So I better make it equal to yi to make this term as small as possible. Otherwise, I'm not actually minimizing the criterion. So those are the two cases, beta i equals 0 or beta i equals yi. Now just compare the criterion values and take whichever one is smaller. That's what this rule is doing. In one case, you get yi squared. In other case, you get lambda i. Right, so there was a very simple argument that gave us that. This hard thresholding problem, like I said, you can think about it as the prox operator of the L0 norm. Uh, and it is exactly that if all these lambda i's are equal to lambda. What happens if I put an x matrix in here? So I ask you to do. L0 penalized regression. Well, we know, we know that's not possible. That's why we solved the lasso problem, for example. Um, in fact, this problem, which is like the best subset selection problem, it's known to be NP-hard. So if you knew how to solve that problem, then you'd be a very popular guy. Let's put it that way. Guy or girl, you'd be very popular, I meant to say. Um, Another non-convex prox operator, this one I think, hard thresholding I'm sure you've all seen. This one I don't know that you would have seen, is um, an L0 segmentation problem. So it's like what we talked about, the fused lasso, but with the L0, the L1 norm replacing the L0 norm. And I'll just call it L0 segmentation. So I, I give you a sequence, yi, ordered, say, across the index 1 through n. And I want you to find the sequence beta i that minimizes the sum of least squared errors plus lambda times the indicator that beta i is not equal to beta i plus 1. So I give you a penalty every time you make a jump. 
So that's I'm calling a segmentation problem because the solution to this for lambda large enough is going to just be a piecewise constant sequence. Because I'm going to be trying to set many of these terms equal to zero at the solution. Okay, so the fused lasso, just to give you, to uh, refresh your memory, fused lasso, it's going to replace that indicator, which we might think of as indicator that um, beta i minus beta i plus 1 is not equal to 0, with the most natural thing, which is just the absolute value of their difference. Okay, interestingly, we can actually solve this problem exactly. We don't need to go to this relaxation, at least not for this simple setup. I mean, we might want to go here anyways. Maybe this has different statistical properties. But we could solve this problem, exactly. And that's done with dynamic programming. Um, there's actually two different dynamic programming algorithms that I know of that solve this problem. And I don't think either of them is very well known. Well, maybe I think Bellman's dynamic programming work is very well known, but maybe just not known to be applied to this problem. So there's an old paper by Bellman which uh, is called on the approximation of curves by line segments using dynamic programming, which gives you the solution to this problem in uh, worst case n squared time. Um, there's another paper by Nick Johnson, who's a statistician, who's now at Google, that uh, I think he has a very beautiful um, dynamic programming to algorithm to solve both this problem and the fuse lasso problem. So actually, both of them can be solved with dynamic programming. And it's not dynamic programming as you may typically have seen it in, a, say, a CS algorithms course, because dynamic programming is, I think, often learned over discrete, a discrete set of variables. Right here, the set of variables is continuous. I'm not restricting you to being able to use only certain levels for beta. So it doesn't reduce to a simple lookup table. These are both kind of very sophisticated algorithms. Um, Johnson's algorithm is more efficient. So I think that in practice, Johnson's algorithm runs more like order n. It's closer to linear time. Uh, its worst case complexity is the same as Bellman's algorithm. But the Bellman algorithm is more general. It solves just really more than this problem. A paper has more content in it. So uh, you know, it's a, another thing that maybe uh, you might take a look at if you're interested in this problem in particular. Uh, last year when I taught this class, there was a, we had a visitor um, in ML who was, uh, he's an expert on optimization. His name is Miguel Carrera Perpignan. And he gave me this example to put in, uh, in this lecture. It's an example of a non-convex prox operator that he developed with one of his um, co-authors, where the prox has to do with projecting onto a set of tree leaves. I think it's a pretty interesting problem. So, I give you some u, this is some target, and I give you a tree, g. So g takes inputs in Rn and it spits out, um, say, it, it you know, funnels you down the tree and it, and it gives you, uh, at the, each leaf it gives you a value 0 or 1. So it, at the leaves it tells you the val a value 0 or 1. And I want you to find a, some estimate z that approximates u as well as possible in the, in the least square sense. Once I add a penalty, which is that I do not want the tree uh, output of z to be different from y. So I give you u and y, and I ask you to find a z that's close to u whose label under g is not unlike y. And if I make lambda large enough, then you, be, you better make the label of um, z equal to y under the tree g. So this, this comes out of a broader problem that um, Miguel and his co-author were looking at, uh, which is this paper you can take a look at, Distributed Optimization of Deeply Nested Systems. Interestingly, this problem you can solve exactly, um, which is a nice, that's why I put it in this lecture, with a pretty clever routine. Um, you can argue that the solution is like this, the hard thresholding problem. It's either going to be. Um, u, you're either just going to take it equal to u, or you're going to choose it equal to what I'll call the projection onto the set S of u, where S is the set of all leaves whose label is equal to 
that of y. Right? So this should really say g inverse of y. I don't know why I put 1 here. So either you're going to take it equal to u to make this term 0, or you're going to, take it, you're going to take it equal to the point whose label is equal to that of y that's closest to u. And we're calling that the projection of u onto s, the set of tree leaves. Those are the only two options you would choose. So how do we project onto a set of tree leaves? That's what this proc operator um, reduces to. It's a very non-convex set. Right? So think about, um, think about a very simple tree. And uh, I have an example of a tree here. And I, the leaves are R1, R2, R3, R4, and R5. And so the tree makes uh, splits based on just the values of individual variables. So the leaves look like they're just a union of rectangles. right? The, the leaves partition the sample space into rectangles. So pro projecting onto any one of these boxes is very fast. right? It just takes order and operations. We learn how to project onto a box. You just truncate the appropriate component. What happens if I give you a union of these things? So suppose that R5, R3, and R4 were the only leaves that had value equal to 1. So I want you to project onto the union of these. Union R5, R4, and R1. That's very non-convex. And you can imagine in a very uh, high dimensional space, a union of boxes is a very non-convex thing. So how do we project onto that efficiently? That's the question. Well, there's two ways you could do it. The first is that you could just look at all the leaves that had value 1, look at all the boxes in the union, and project onto each of them. Those each take order n time. And then you just choose the one right, that has the smallest value distance between that and u. That's the brute force way to do it. So there's actually nothing wrong with that. So that could be very inefficient if the number of leaves is very high, right, in a very high dimensional space. It could be very, very, very large. So here's a faster way of doing it that um, I think is pretty neat that Miguel and his co-author developed, which is that let's decorate each node in the tree. So every node in the tree, I'm going to decorate it with um, all the labels of its leaves. So for this one, I'm just going to write down all the labels of all the leaves. For this one, I'm going to write down the labels of R1 and R2. For this one, I'll write down the labels of R3, R4, and R5. And for this one, just R4 and R5. So every node has a list of the labels of its leaves. And um, every node also has a label of it, the bounding box for all of its leaves. Right? So R1 and R2, their bounding box is this, this whole box. So that's what we'll label this node with. Um, this node, its leaves are R3, R4, R5. Its bounding box is this, this big box. So that's how we'll label it, et cetera. And now we're going to go down and we're going to perform depth first search on the tree. And at every node in the tree, we're going to either keep it or prune it. And we're going to prune it if none of its leaves um, have the label Y, which we can see, right, because we've labeled all of its leaves. So if we're at any point where in the tree where the leaves only have label 0 below that node, we just prune it. Or if the bounding box of that node for its leaves is farther away from the smallest bounding box we've seen, or the closest bounding box we've seen so far to you, then we also prune it away. Because that means that um, if the bounding box is farther away, then nothing inside the bounding box can be closer to you than the current thing that we've seen. So we go down the tree in a depth first search manner, and we just chop off entire subtrees based on this rule. And this is actually, it it's, makes a, a huge difference in terms of the complexity of that prox operation. Well, that was a pretty clever non-convex prox application. All right, we only have example, uh, time for maybe one more example. Um, so I'm not sure what it's going to be. Discrete problems, I skipped. Infinite dimensional problems, these are convex problems that uh, are infinite dimensional rather than finite dimensional that you can solve exactly. So that's why I put them in this lecture. So I'm going to skip that also. Let me end with a, a, a pretty, a pretty uh, timely topic, which is sparse undetermined linear systems. So let's consider this problem. I want you to find the sparsest solution to a linear system. I give you um, a linear system x beta equals y. And I ask you to find the vector beta that minimizes the L0 norm, so it has the least number of entries among all uh, solutions to this system. 
Now, when would this problem be easy? It'd be easy if this uh, linear system had just one solution, because then it's the sparsest by uh, process of elimination. This problem is hard. In fact, it's NP-hard when this system is generically underdetermined. So if you give me, say, matrix X, which is n by p, and p is very, very big compared to n. Um, it's obviously non-convex because of the L0 norm, right? I have minimized some non-convex problem subject, non-convex function subject to a linear equality constraint. Well, what would you do now that you've learned, you know, optimization and you've seen examples of relaxations, say the lasso, you would just reduce this, you would relax this to an L1 norm, right? So this is sometimes called the noiseless lasso or basis pursuit. Those are two names for it. There's a very deep connection between these two problems. And um, I'm going to talk about results that come from this paper by Donahoe, which is, I'd say this was one of the papers that ignited the field of compressed sensing. So this paper was one of the original papers that kind of got people interested in compressed sensing. It's not the only one. So there's lots of other results that are related that you can take a look at. And I gave, I think, a link to a review paper on the next slide. And here's the connection. Um, let's suppose that n and p go very large and p is bigger than n. Then what Donahoe proves is that there is a threshold row, some row, that's a function of the ratio p over n. And it has the property that for most matrices x, and I'll tell you what that means in a second, if you solve this L1 problem, which you can do as a linear program that might have even been on the homework, or I think we had it in the notes at one point, this is, can be written as an LP. And you happen to find a solution that has fewer than rho times n non-zero components. So think of rho as this critical ratio. Then you are guaranteed that, uh, first of all, this L0 problem has a unique solution, and you found it. It's pretty amazing. You solve this LP. If the solution is sparse, by which we mean it has less than rho times n entries, then it is the unique solution to this NP-hard problem. If you solve the LP, the basis pursuit problem, and your solution is not sparse, which means that it has bigger than rho times n non-zero components, then it's not the solution, necessarily, to the L0, um, basis, to L0 uh, underdetermined system problem. But there is no solution to that problem that has less than rho times n entries. So maybe you don't care anyways. Right? If you only want a sparse solution, then, and you solve the basis of pursuit problem, and you didn't find one, then actually you're told that the, um, you know, this sparse underdetermined system wouldn't have had a sparse solution anyways at the level rho times n. So you, maybe you shouldn't have bothered solving it anyways. So this, this statement is actually probabilistic. So I'm hiding a bunch of probability statements. Um, most means that if we look at most matrices, whose columns are normalized to have uh, norm 1, and we look at the set of matrices with that property, um, then with high probability over that set, think about drawing uniformly over that set, this occurs. And that probability only gets uh, greater and greater as, rho, as p and n increase together. Okay, So there's some critical threshold rho that is, uh, has this property. So this, this ignited, I think, uh, in many ways, the field of compressed sensing, it told us that approximating the L0 norm with the L1 norm can be really good in sparse situations, provably. And there's a huge body of literature on this stuff. Um, there's a nice review paper by Donahoe and some of his co-authors you can take a look at. There's also a ton of other um, literature that if you're interested in, in finding, you can come see me. Okay, that was it. We didn't have time for all of the problems, obviously. If, you, if there are some problems here that interested you that I didn't talk about, come my office hours or talk to me sometime. And that was it. I'll see you on Monday for the exam.